Thank you, everybody, for coming to talk about how tech can solve global health inequality. Healthcare feels like it's been on the verge of transformation for years, if not decades. But in a matter of months, the pandemic broke down long-standing barriers and accelerated digital health at a, a pace few could have imagined. But vast health disparities still plague the world. The WHO has identified the conditions in which people are born, as well as where they grow, live, work, age, can influence a significant percentage of health outcomes. Most advanced economies tend to produce medicines and biotech advancements at a faster pace. And communities in those economies tend to have quicker access to new innovations. So how can we make sure that we have health equality where everyone has access and affordable health care with these new innovations? And how can investors prioritize equality while still getting a return? I'm joined by a wonderful panel to talk about that today. Nita Madhav, Senior Director of Ginkgo Bioworks. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ali Parsa, Founder and CEO of Babylon Health. Sophie Smith, Founder and CEO of nab to health And Dr. Shamshir Vayalil, Chair and Managing Director of BPS Healthcare. Thank you so much for joining us. Sophie, let's start with you. You know, we talk about tech and how can it can solve all of our problems, not just in health, but everywhere, right? But technology is a tool, and it's less about whether it can, you know, address inequality on its own, and more about how people use it and become more sophisticated in developing health solutions for everyone. Yeah, that's correct. So we've had um, various tools at our disposal for years now um, with analog or digital capabilities that could all, at some point in the right hands, have potentially solved health inequalities. Um, with digital technologies, and I think when people think about digital tech, specifically in the context of low and middle income countries, they're predominantly talking about phones. You have a tool that can fundamentally do two things. It allows you to hold on your person at any one point in time a, a lot of information. Um, information that you can access and use, information about yourself, your money, your contacts. Um, and the second thing it allows you to do is to share that with everybody. So I think the bigger question is, no, is not can we use tech to solve global health inequalities, but will at any point in our lifetimes human beings learn to share? It's a great point. And Nita, you've said the same. I mean, it's a tool, right? But it's really how society uses it. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the important thing to keep in mind here is that technology is can't be the be all and end all. It is going to be a part of the solution. And um, you know, one thing that that we think about a lot is how does this fit into the broader framework of global health and biosecurity? Because we're thinking from the standpoint of how do we build better health systems to be able to address the inequalities. Because we've seen, even with pandemics, that this actually exacerbates the existing inequalities. So the better that we can get at preventing, detecting, and responding to epidemics and pandemics, the better that we can solve the problem of inequality. So talk a little bit about those key areas where technology can play a role in helping us combat those health threats. Absolutely. Um, so the first place that I see we can apply technology where we haven't done so effectively in the past is actually more effective surveillance systems to really detect when those first cases are emerging or even in a more futuristic sense to anticipate where cases from an epidemic or pandemic might start. And one of the ways to do this is by building a persistent pervasive and passive surveillance systems that are constantly monitoring, not just waiting for something to happen before news uh, reaches places where you know, then a response can be mounted. So the first is the improved surveillance systems. The second is really in, the, in trying to improve the existing health systems. Because if the health systems don't function in regular times, then we really can't expect them to perform well in times of crisis. So it's really a matter of improving those health systems 
And of course, this is not just a technological innovation. This, is, this really comes down to improving in the areas of community health, improving the numbers of healthcare workers, and you know, adding to, to those, the health systems in that way. And then the third area where I see technology could really uh, achieve some um, growth and equality is that um, we've seen now a trend towards more localized production systems for countermeasure, medical countermeasures and vaccines. And this could be an area where there's more local capacity is built, and then that can also help to improve the global distribution of these life-saving drugs and vaccines. Shamsi, are talking about improving healthcare systems. You focus also on building capacity. So how does tech help you do that? So for me, it's never been tech alone. I'm a hospital guy for my manufacturing. So for us, it's an enabler. It's, it's something to connect the patient with the system. So we have seen during COVID, the front doors open through technology. We had telemedicine, which was always there, which you are masters of it. But we have seen how that changed the whole way people look at healthcare, because there was no need for people to come into the hospitals. And that also helps us to reduce the cost, because rising cost is a big uh, issue for all the governments. The workforce, for me, that particular workforce access to remote areas is what tech can do a, a major role, because connecting the last mile. And you know, tech is always, health is a sector where there's a lot of regulations, because it's dealing with lives. So I think we need an a, a open door policy where regulators come and share the data. Like you said, you, you mentioned a very valid point because I think it's a, a global problem. The, the, the COVID is gone, we see people gathering, but the next one that comes, we should look at you know, technology with a different lens altogether. So, and Ali, Babylon's mission is to put accessible and affordable health service in the hands of every person on earth. And so I would assume that technology helps you do that. How does that, how well, do you use technology to you know, help in the access and affordability? So if you break that sentence, accessible, as long as you can deliver most of the healthcare most people need on the mobile devices they already have, that's highly accessible. As Dr. Shamshir just quite rightly described, in the pandemic, we had no other choice. We did have to deliver our healthcare on remotely. Prior to the pandemic, people thought that cannot be done. Amazing how it was done almost overnight when there was no other choice. Then the question becomes affordable. Uh, two thirds of the costs in healthcare, as Dr. Shamshir again just said, sit in the workforce. If you can automate some of what they do, you significantly reduce the cost. And, to, and it just happens that 70% on the, the cost are on predictable, preventable diseases. Um, what we do with our body is what we used to do with our cars 20 years ago. We wait until it breaks down, we take it to a garage. We're all like that, right? right? We all do that. So the question really is, can we collect enough data as we do with our cars? Can we bury enough sensors to collect the data to see what's happening, to intervene earlier, to reduce the cost. It's a long-term shift, but that shift from sick care to healthcare and from manual to automated is the secret to affordability in health. So you're not only saying like, and we'll talk about you know, some of these health apps and, and things like that, but you're not only saying that it's a tool for the patient, but you're saying that the data is really one of the most key aspects of the tech which helps the, the healthcare provider do more preventative medicine? I, I'm, I'm, if I can dare I go a little bit further, I think that data is everything. Uh, it, to me, it makes no sense that we wait until a data show itself in a symptom and then we wait for a human being to take an action on that symptom to feel so miserable until they go see a doctor versus being able to collect that data in real time through our watches, phones, embeddables, tests, to be able to act fundamentally more quickly on that data. And Sophie, I mean, talk about that. You know, healthcare is moving towards a more consumer-centered model, 
where people are shopping for healthcare, sharing data with apps and services across technology, and that's democratizing access to healthcare and you know, has an opportunity to create more equality because the access is more readily available. It is. The irony is that actually without fundamental shifts in the ecosystem, even if you were to make tools available to every person on earth today, there would not be health equality. The reason for that is because um, the vast majority of clinical trials and research today do not occur in a distributed fashion across the world. 92% occur in the US and Europe. The remaining 8% mostly occur in the Far East, where they have to be demographically representative. Um, which means that only a very, very, very small percentage of clinical trial participants A, are female, about 19%, 19% in total, and a tiny percentage of those are of Middle East and African South Asian origin. So maybe you can talk about democratized access through, through effective tooling, um, but as Ali says, you know, the data is everything, and until that data is representative, not just of a subset of the human population, but the entire population, we will never have health equality. So you're saying that it's not just about the access to healthcare and the software solutions for, say, community health workers or healthcare providers in low resource setting, but you're saying if the data isn't being kind of developed with that in mind, it's always going to have that inequity. Correct. I mean, you just need to look at the mics that we're all wearing. They're meant to be invisible, but they have been developed by white Caucasians for white Caucasian skin. And then on the majority of faces in this audience, they are not invisible. And that's what happens, not just in healthcare, but in everything, e every aspect of human-centric design. There is a lack of inclusivity, which means that the things that are built the medications that are designed, the drugs that are tested, the tools and the procedures that are put into place are not inclusive. So, so Nita, for the new technologies to reduce the inequality and not introduce more inequality, we need to be more intentional about how these new technologies are being developed and deployed. Yeah, absolutely. I think Sophie made a, a very fantastic point that uh, the, the biases and the the inequalities that we, you know, maybe sometimes even don't, don't realize that we have can play a role as we develop technology. Technology is not neutral. It's going to encompass all of the, the biases of the, the people that develop it. And so I think part of what we need to do for being intentional is really to think about the whole population and to think about how to have community engagement and engaging the different parts of the, the whole population when we're thinking about developing these solutions. Um, Ali, talk about what ways countries can develop opportunities to entice global investors and innovators into advancing development, these type of developments through partnerships that we're talking about here. So, so I think that if you look at a adjacent industry, take um, automotive cars. Uh, Lucid has started thinking about putting a manufacturing facility, for instance, in Saudi Arabia. And the way they did that was because the Saudis made it very clear that they're welcome here and they're allowed to develop here. And that was a shift from a combustion engine to electric, and they grasped the, uh, that, that transition. I think in healthcare, I believe that we're going to see a transition from the sick care that is facility-based, doctor-based, uh, sickness-based, into healthcare, which is about data-centric, proactive, continuous monitoring, and predicting to, uh, uh, to proactively uh, act. Whoever, whichever authority embraces that, they will attract the kind of companies who want to go and show that can be done. So it is not about investment, it's about creating the infrastructure, the regulatory environment for innovation in the healthcare. Well, and on the equality issue, I mean, how can, Shamsir, you know, how can investment play a role in prioritizing these emerging markets for when funding these medical and biotech advancements, how can we make that case that preventative investment, basic levels of care, 
instead of the kind of crisis management that we're talking about. I think what I feel is that every investor wants returns. Every startups, the people that invest into the startups, they are also looking for return. And if you take those into the emerging markets or the frontier, there's always a risk factor which increases the expectation of the returns. So I think what we are missing is the scale because healthcare is so done in pockets. You have the US systems which cannot, you don't see the scale, right? You see a center, you take them out of US, it rarely works. But I think what we are missing is a scale play where we have to think of industrializing healthcare. We need more of a hybrid model where tech alone can be the solution. So I think we have the pharma companies only looking at the new molecules, but they're not part of making sure that the health outcomes as a provider takes the risk is not happening. Well, on that, on that note, how does biotech have a role to play in advancing inequality? So I think it's all about bringing the cost down. People have realized that the luxury of healthcare is gone. It's becoming a necessity. And it's not just your borders or the boundaries that define what your uh, uh, you know, economy can perform. Because we have seen during COVID, it happened, started somewhere, reached across the globe. Because it's all a connected world. So I don't think that any country or region would want to take that risk again. So it's always important to use these technologies to do a proper surveillance and make sure that we are not hit by uh, a surprise again, which I don't think the economies can take. So probably, you know, we keep crying about equality, but I think it has a business case that has an opportunity. This is where minds can meet. These are the forums where ideas can evolve. And I think having Saudi as one of the, the major leaders in uh, these kind of platforms, I think like Lucid can come, many disruptions can come east. And I think this is where I think the disruption can happen. But but being more kind of localization also has to be targeted to that market then. So I think every market cannot, because everyone wants this to be a local play, right? But for me, I think it's a global play. We have seen the dynamic shift. We need the scale and scale cannot come from just one region alone because we will never have enough workforce or resources to keep duplicating and that will again increase the cost. So I think with like Saudi looking at downstreams, a lot of API, the active pharmaceutical ingredients come from downstream. So there's a lot of value proposition that people are seeing. So cross-border ecosystem is opening up. So probably that is, I think, the way to look at stuff at this point of time. So Sophie, not to health, we would be considered, I guess, what they call femtech now, which is this term applied to a category of software diagnostics products and services that use technology to focus on women's health. And I think when we talk about equity, um, we forget that you know we're also addressing the gender issue. Yeah, so it's a funny thing. I mean, fem if you talk about women's health, people tend to automatically think reproductive health. But when we think healthcare for women, we're thinking about making sure that everything that is designed and built in the healthcare ecosystem works as well for women as it does for men. Again, women were excluded from uh, clinical trials until 1993, largely which means that today women are still 50 to 75% more likely than men to suffer adverse reactions to drugs because the majority of drugs, including things like paracetamol, haven't necessarily been designed for or tested on women. Um, actually, what we look at specifically is chronic disease management. And chronic diseases are another really interesting area because you talk about introducing surveillance so that we can anticipate where the next pandemic might arise. But there's no point doing that if as in the US, 88% of the adult population are chronically unwell. So 88% of adults in the US have insulin resistance, which is a precursor to diabetes and, and a whole load of other chronic diseases. That's two thirds of all healthy weight adults, 92% of overweight adults, and over 99.5% of obese adults. And what um, health experts during the pandemic were very quick to realize is that if you have an underlying health condition like insulin resistance, you become at risk <coughs> for COVID-19 and any other communicable disease. So as long as we as a population continue to be accidentally unwell, it doesn't matter how much effort we put into understanding where the next pandemic might be coming from. When it comes, we will still go into a global lockdown. There will still be massive kind of uh, implications from an, a global economic perspective. We have to work at at educating and supporting people and becoming healthy and, and well on a, on a daily basis. To Ali's point, 
um, healthcare needs to become about healthcare, not sick care. And for that to happen in a world where the vast majority of the disease burden is chronic rather than acute, it has to be devolved out of facilities and become decentralized, patient-centric, and patient-led. Well, Nita, how much do you think that COVID created a demand for digital health care and, and healthy innovations? And again, are we, did, did we learn the lesson of COVID? Or are these still like chronic, dealing chronic conditions and not the kind of preventative, um, data-centric, or even, you know, like one of the gentlemen that um, I was talking to this week has a healthcare app that, you know, will deliver anything anywhere. I mean, how much are these just like symptomatic but not kind of treating the problem? Well, I think it's a great question. And I think COVID was probably the, the most uh, studied epidemic. There generated a, a wealth of data. But um, I think to Sophie's point, I don't think it's really necessarily shifted the mindset into more of a prevention and a proactive approach, as, as Ali mentioned. And I think that's something that we've been trying to look at in the global health community. And I think I see a lot of parallels uh, in the clinical community as well, that there really needs to be a, a shift of mindset to a more proactive system and approach and really thinking about how to anticipate and to, to treat or even you know, to have preventive care before something really becomes out of, out of control and unmanageable. Mm -hmm. Ali. Honestly, Sophie is now my number one new hero <laughs> <laughs> uh, in healthcare. I, I don't know how well you've been listening to what she's saying, but the problem is the healthcare model we have now, this $10 trillion industry, Ten trillion dollars. Global healthcare, but the lar one of the largest in sectors in the whole uh, world economy, supports a tiny minority of human beings. Vast majority of humans have very little access to healthcare. Uh, and imagine how much bigger our industry would be, and how much more powerful it'd be if it served most rather than a, a small number. And the reality is, I think Einstein said, the definition of insanity is to keep doing what we've been doing and expect the different results. And the reality is that we keep doing what we do because as Shamshir quite rightly said, when it goes to take investment, people will look at the track record of what worked and invest in what worked. So you have this circular situation. So when disruptive innovations happen, it happens through a magical moment in time that an insanely bright person like an Elon Musk comes along and makes the impossible possible by being able to collect so much capital over such a prolonged period of thing to make a Tesla work. Can you imagine if the current condition where the money for growth has dried out existed only four years ago? Yeah, I mean, Shamshir, why don't I mean, people, they, we invest in biotech, right? Because that's considered a high return, um, a high return sector. But healthcare, you know, why is that not considered a sector that would have great returns when the impact and the need is so great? Now, I think the, if you look at the US systems, the most successful organizations are all not for profit. So I think there has been a, a cultural thinking that healthcare is not meant to make profits. If you say I'm a hospital network, we make so much margins and it's like, you know, is it good? But I think it's good enough to have more investments like what Ali said, it's, it's the largest industry. We are at the face of something like a recession coming in. I think we need to act fast. We need to think of wider scale, otherwise we'll keep talking about this. We'll keep talking about equality. We'll keep talking about democratizing. I think if the people like us don't sit across and come up with a solution, I think that would be a, a grave mistake that we all will do. So, and, and then on the investment, I mean, when you go back to what you were saying earlier, Sophie, about how women, for instance, that, you know, that is, again, a whole sector of potential investment in investing in half of the population 
you would think that would be much more of a driver of um, commerce. An investment. Yes, you'd have thought. I think to Ali's point, um, people invest most of the time, despite the fact that venture capital historically has been a risk taker's game, in things that they have seen work in other places. So if you say that you're going to build exclusively for a segment of the population that has largely been excluded, you're by default. Well, there's a white space in the market. <laughs> yeah, but it's not perceived that way. Um, it's not perceived as. As, as, as a gap, it's still weirdly perceived as a niche. Um, I think, I mean, in, in, in the women's healthcare space to date, there still has not been a single venture capital dollar invested into women's health technologies in the MENA region outside Israel. Um, all of the investments that have been done into women's health technologies to date have been angel investments. Um, well, that might also be because women have, which is a whole other panel, but women are the ones that are going to be developing that and they don't have access to capital. Uh, the statistics would agree with you. In the MENA region last year, 1.2% uh, of venture capital went to female founders. Um, we had our 1. worst... 1.2%. Yeah, we, we had our worst month ever, I think in July this year. It's got worse since COVID, by the way. 0.1% of venture capital in the MENA region went to female-founded companies. And that's not for the lack of female-founded companies that are raising. Um, and I, I actually tried to explain this with my kids um, the other day. I, I, have, I have three and another one due in May, and I had my five-year-old son and my three-year-old daughter sit, and I said, right, I'm going to give you M&Ms, 100 M&Ms between the two of you to start a chocolate shop. You both have to start a chocolate shop with these M&Ms. You can sell them, you can exchange them with other chocolates, and I gave one to my daughter, and I gave 99 to my son. And there was outrage. I mean, my daughter burst into tears. My son immediately tried to give half of his M&Ms to my daughter. But when you sit there like that with kids who understand justice in an innate way that I think as we as adults have often lost a sense of, um, you see also the, how much further my daughter would have to go in order to even get to the point where she had the equivalent of 99 M&Ms to trade with. And, not only... Or 45. Or 45. But there, and there are two mm. things. Not only does she have fewer, she has fewer to make mistakes with. Because she has one M&M, she has to make the right decision with that M&M first time. Otherwise, she's out of M&Ms. And what does she hear? Well, you know, that's why girls don't start chocolate shops. So I think there's a significant bias in the industry today. Um, my uh, attitude has always been... You just have to stick around and survive like a cockroach for as long as possible. And eventually, you talk enough about an issue, you, you show enough with what you're building and the data you're creating that there's a need and the opportunity is real and profitable. Eventually, the ecosystem will change. Um, we just have a minute left, Nita. Um, this isn't just a technology issue, right? It's a whole of society issue. There's a lot of mistrust, a lot of hesitancy that can't be ignored here. Absolutely. I think that we, we can't lose sight of that, that technology is going to be an enabler. It's going to be critical for driving the future forward. But when you hear the, you know, the stories and you, you've experienced uh, the, the inherent bias that's um, in the world and that's, you know, that has to be something that we take into account of. Um, we have to make uh, community engagement part of the solution. We have to educate. We have to move that needle forward so that it's not, you know, we, we can't just think we're going to develop technology and that's going to solve all the, the problems. There's a lot of other enabling factors that need to come into play to, for this to work. Any closing thoughts? And I think ESG is the best way forward, right? Focus yeah. on ESG can make a lot of difference. We need that to embrace at the core of what we do, probably that could be a good way to address all the gender, all the you know equitable access, democratization, transparency. And I think that's where we can find the. Is ESG the answer? Sorry. Is ESG the answer? You know, I always worry about people who say, "I'm not sexist or I'm not, I'm not racist," right? It's the same with the corporation. If it turns back and says the core of a I, I am pro-ESG, 
fundamentally it means it missed the point. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do, I'm a big believer that good business does good, and by doing good, it it returns good too. Okay. Um, I think it needs to be part and parcel, which is which is ESG. Yeah, but I think and be the cockroach, as Sophie said. <laughs> um, to my panel, thank you very much. Thank you to FII, and um, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Lisa.